and welcome back to Adventures with Ariel. Disney and Broadway are a match made in heaven. And this was the case well before Beauty and the Beast opened at the Palace Theater 25 years ago. You see, the theater played a huge role in Disney's Renaissance era and was the reason it was so successful. In 1984, Broadway producer Peter Schneider was brought on to run Disney's animation department. And soon after, composer Alan Menken and playwright Howard Ashman were brought on to create the score for Disney's most ambitious project, The Little Mermaid. Together, they structured the 1989 film as a Broadway-inspired musical, complete with show-stopping song and dance numbers and an I Want ballad, sung by Broadway veteran Jody Benson. A few years later, the formula would be repeated, with Minkin and Ashman once again on board, and this time, it would be met with even greater success. If The Little Mermaid created the Broadway formula, the 1991's Beauty and the Beast perfected it. The film had it all. The hero song, the villain song, the love song, and the showstopper. Heck, Beauty and the Beast is so Broadway that Belle's princess song quickly evolves into a full-blown cast number whilst introducing the story's villain. Upon its release, critics hailed Beauty and the Beast as one of the year's finest musicals and immediately noted that the film had Broadway potential, encouraging then-CEO Michael Eisner to bravely venture into the theater world. Beauty and the Beast would be the first of many Broadway shows produced by Disney Theatrical Productions formed in 1993 by Disney Parks Live production head, Ron Logan. By this point, Howard Ashman had passed away, so lyricist Tim Rice joined Alan Menken in fleshing out the score. Linda Wolverton, who had worked on the film's screenplay, was brought on to adapt the script for the stage. Beauty and the Beast opened at Broadway's Palace Theater on April 18, 1994. It was met with overwhelmingly critical reviews, and many Broadway purists felt that the corporate giant would conflict with the culture of Times Square. But audiences felt in love with Beauty and the Beast. According to the New York Times, ticket sales for the new musical hit over $600,000 the very next day, breaking the Broadway box office record for ticket sales on the day after an opening night. Until then, the only other musical that made more money in a single day was The Phantom of the Opera on its premiere in 1987. After this triumphant opening week, one thing became very clear. Disney was a hit in New York. Come 1995, and Disney Theatrical signed a 49-year revenue-based lease for the new Amsterdam Theater on Broadway. Tim Tompkins, president of the Times Square Alliance, recalls that before Disney's investment, no one wanted to touch the new Amsterdam Theater, which at the time was in such bad shape that there were mushrooms growing on the floor. Yikes! It should also be noted that at this time, New Amsterdam's home, 42nd Street, was a haven for porn shops, drug dealers, and crime. So in exchange for bringing their shows and brand to Times Square, Disney pushed for 42nd Street to be cleaned up and made more tourist friendly. Gone were the peep shows and sex shops, and in came a beautifully renovated New Amsterdam theater. It would be there that The Lion King would first take the stage on November 13th, 1997. Critics praised the show for its imaginative costumes, staging, and unique theatrical experience, all made possible by director and costume designer Julie Tamer. She won two Tony Awards in those respective categories, and The Lion King won the Best Musical Tony Award for that season. Not only is The Lion King the third longest running show in Broadway history, but it's also the top earning title in box office history for both stage productions and films. Well, if anyone's going to achieve those kind of numbers, it's gonna be The Lion King, am I right? So after the stunning success of The Lion King, Disney was ready to continue the winning streak. Their next endeavor was a musical called Ada, and would be Disney's first attempt at a show that did not originate as a hit animated movie. It was somewhat successful, receiving four Tony Awards, a Grammy, and a four and a half year run. However, it was the production after Ada that proved to be the company's first flop. Tarzan opened at Broadway's Richard Rogers Theater on May 10th, 2006, and the critical response was, eh. Featuring aerial acrobatics and an extended score by Phil Collins, the show struggled to find an audience and closed after just 14 months of operation. It was also completely overlooked at the Tony Awards, but has since proven to have a strong shelf life in regional theaters and high schools. So Tarzan wasn't cut out for Broadway, but 2006 would also see the debut of Mary Poppins at the New Amsterdam Theater. And needless to say, this production was much more successful, featuring incredible scenic design and never before seen choreography. The show was also nominated for a plethora of Tony Awards, winning one for Best Scenic Design. As a result, audiences flocked to see Mary Poppins until it closed on March 3rd, 2013, after 2,619 performances. During Mary Poppins' run, another Disney favorite got the Broadway treatment. 
The Little Mermaid. And given that the animated film ushered in Disney's successful Broadway formula, the show was basically a guaranteed success, right? Eh, kind of. The Little Mermaid opened at Broadway's Lunt Fontan Theater in 2007, and it fared slightly better than Tarzan, running for 685 performances. Under the direction of Francesca Sambello, clever attempts were made to recreate the undersea world of the animated film. Alan Menken, along with Glenn Slater, came up with some fun new songs, and playwright Doug Wright reworked the screenplay for the stage. Many of the performers wore wheeled footwear called Heelys to simulate swimming, and fans praised Cherie Renee Scott's deliciously camp portrayal of Ursula. But it sadly wasn't enough to give the show any longevity, and The Little Mermaid ended its run on August 30th, 2009. After a lackluster couple of years on Broadway, Disney came back with a vengeance with the enormously successful stage version of an unlikely film. In 1992, Disney's Newsies had tanked at the box office, and to this day remains one of the studio's lowest grossing films of all time. However, through the magic of home video, Newsies quickly became a cult favorite among musical fans. Fans who, for years, begged for a stage adaptation. Well, Disney heard their cries, and in 2011, a reimagined Newsies debuted at the Paper Mill Playhouse in Milburn, New Jersey. It was initially intended to be a regional run, but the production was a huge hit, so Disney decided to bring it to Broadway's Nederlander Theater on March 29th, 2012, for a limited engagement. Well, that limited engagement proved to be so popular that Newsies eventually went on to an open-ended run, lasting 1,004 performances and receiving eight Tony nominations. It won for Best Choreography and Best Score. Come 2014, and another Renaissance classic would get the stage treatment. After tryouts in Seattle and Toronto, Aladdin finally found a home in the New Amsterdam Theater and quickly became a box office smash. Broadway fans were especially enamored with James Monroe Eagleheart's Tony Award-winning interpretation of Genie. The show has lasted for over 2,000 100 performances and continues to sell out shows to this day. Over at the St. James Theater, Disney fans can also catch Frozen. After the unprecedented success of the 2013 movie, which went on to become the highest grossing animated feature ever, it was only a matter of time before Disney Theatrical would announce a Broadway stage adaptation. Upon its 2018 debut, the show was met with lukewarm reception, with critics calling it visually drab, mechanical, and often boring. Harsh. Not to mention that the New York Post reported that theatergoers were giving it the cold shoulder just months after its opening. Yeah, we're talking theaters that are only three quarters full. A little unusual for a Broadway play adapted from an extremely successful Disney film. Could Frozen have a similar fate to that of Tarzan or The Little Mermaid? Only time will tell. And hey, Beauty and the Beast didn't do so hot with critics either, but to this day remains a crowd favorite. The show was an enormous risk from the beginning. Being the company's first animated feature turned live action Broadway production, there were many uncertainties and many naysayers. People who thought that Disney was dumbing down the American musical and creating nothing but a corporate money-making machine out of the art form. People who believed that Disney was sucking the originality out of Broadway and replacing it with musicals based on all already popular movies merely to make the business more money. But there were also many who were able to see the success that it was bringing back to the Great White Way. A rise in tourism, ticket sales, and a rebirth of interest in the theater. Regardless of whether or not the critics fully appreciated their Broadway venture, Disney opened up a new door to a place where both adults and children could come to find entertainment of the highest caliber. So let me know in the comments section below if you've ever seen a Disney theatrical production. I've been fortunate enough to catch Beauty and the Beast and Mary Poppins on stage. One stage moment that particularly stood out to me was seeing Mary Poppins, umbrella in hand, flying over the audience, 50 feet in the air. That was incredible, let me tell you. And if you learned something new today, you know what to do. Please give this video a huge thumbs up. And if you're new here, consider hitting that subscribe button down below for Disney history every Sunday. All right, y'all, thank you so much for watching. And as always, have a magical day.